Welcome to the Deep Dive, your shortcut to mastering the big ideas reshaping our world. Today, we're diving into blockchain security, but uh, maybe not how you'd expect. We're looking at a threat that's really subtle, strategic. It's, well, potentially way more insidious than just a brute force hack. Exactly. Forget the 51% attack narrative for a moment. Imagine a major network, say, Ethereum or, you know, any chain using these complex block auctions, imagine it facing a system-wide failure. Not because the crypto is broken, not because someone bought up half the stake. No, we're digging into new research about an early warning system, a system that measures how close the blockchain's internal market structure is to a kind of tipping point, a point where you get systemic risk, censorship, maybe even cartels forming. Yeah, this really shifts the focus, doesn't it? Traditionally, security meant counting validators, counting stake. Our mission today is to unpack these sources, showing the danger actually hides in the um, strategic interactions between the key players, the builders, the relays, the proposers in Ethereum's proposer builder separation or PBS system. It's a structural risk. And crucially, it's completely separate from how much stake is concentrated. OK, so for you, the listener, maybe holding assets or running nodes, the big question is this. How can a network that looks decentralized on paper still basically collapse or censor transactions just because a few big players change their strategy? It seems less about direct control, more about, well, conformity pressure. Okay, let's get into it. Right. To grasp this attack vector, we first need a quick picture of the roles in this uh, MEV supply chain. MEV being maximum extractable value. You've got builders. Their job is to put together the most profitable block of transactions they can find. Okay. Maximizing value. Makes sense. Then you have relays. Think of them as secure messengers. They take sealed bids from these builders and pass them along. Sealed bids so it's blind. Blind until the end, yeah. And finally, the proposers, these are the validators, they just pick the highest bid offered by any relay. That block gets finalized. Simple enough on the surface. Okay, builder, relay, proposer, got it. Where does the problem come in? The problem stems from something the sources call strategic complementarity. That's the, uh, the key mechanism for this new kind of attack. It basically means that what's best for one player really depends on what other especially powerful players are doing. Ah, like network effects, but for strategic decisions. Exactly. It creates these really strong incentives to just follow the herd, herding behavior. Okay. So strategic complementarity. Yeah. It's like institutional peer pressure. Let's use that scenario from the research. It was quite vivid. Imagine you've got this big dominant relay. Let's say it controls, I don't know, 30% of the market and it suddenly decides to start filtering transactions. Maybe censoring certain stablecoin transfers, for instance, or blocking specific DeFi apps. Perhaps they're feeling regulatory heat, who knows? Right, now picture a smaller relay. They see this happening. They're faced with a strategic choice, aren't they? They absolutely are. They look at the big player, the 30% one, and think, okay, if they're filtering and I don't, yeah. am I gonna lose out? Will builders start avoiding me because I'm not compliant? Or maybe, will proposers start seeing my non-filtered blocks as risky? Maybe reject them. That fear, that purely economic competitive fear of being left behind, that's what triggers the casting. Precisely. That fear drives them to conform, to also start filtering, even if they weren't forced to by any consensus rule. And this behavior ripples out. Suddenly you've got system-wide censorship happening, way below any 51% or 66% threshold needed for traditional consensus attacks. That difference is critical. Consensus capture, the old model, needs huge state control. Effective control power, they call it. This coordination risk, this strategic cascade, yeah. it can bite when the network structure just gets unbalanced. Maybe just a couple dominant relays and builders emerge. And this new warning system we're talking about, it's designed to spot that specific risk, the subtle strategic kind. Yes, exactly. It's looking for something invisible to the old security models that just count stake. Right. OK. So we're shifting from watching brute force potential to watching uh, market structure fragility. How do we measure that fragility then? Mm -hmm. You mentioned this early warning system based on three KPIs, key performance indicators like traffic lights for network health. That's a good analogy. Traffic lights. And yes, these KPIs are derived mathematically. They come from analyzing the network structure, basically. The map of who connects to whom between builders, relays, and proposers, and the strategic incentives involved. So what are these lights? Okay, the first light, let's call it the green light zone, is the stability margin, S. Think of this as your safety buffer. How far are you from danger? The bigger S is, the safer you are. Right. The system is considered stable only if S is positive greater than zero. Okay, that's the buffer. 
But what tells us when that buffer is getting thin, when we're approaching danger? Ah, that's the second light, the amber light, maybe. The crucial one, the early warning index, EWI. This EWI flags vulnerability when you're getting really close to that operational tipping point. If EWI climbs above zero, well, the system's on high alert. Above zero means danger zone. Pretty much. The math behind it involves the network's influence map, its spectral properties, but the simple takeaway is EWI zero means the forces pulling agents together strategically are now stronger than the friction keeping them independent. Okay, EWI greater than zero, bad news. But you mentioned a third index, the CRI. What about things like just panic or external shocks, like a government announcement? Great question. That's exactly where the third index, the Cascade Risk Index, CRI, comes in. This may be your red light flashing. CRI measures how vulnerable the network is to a public signal, an external push. Is a big regulatory announcement or, say, a major player changing their policy publicly strong enough to actually trigger that cascade we talked about? Ah, so EWI says it's vulnerable. CRI says a push this big will actually make it fall over. You got it. If CRI goes above one, you flag a potential cascade. It means the network is susceptible to these information shocks. And this isn't just theory, right? The sources showed simulations. Well, yeah, very clearly. This EWI equals zero point. It's proven to be a sharp threshold in the models. They ran Monte Carlo simulations. As EWI crossed from just slightly negative to slightly positive, the probability of a system-wide cascade didn't just creep up. It jumped. It jumped dramatically from around 25% chance to over 60% chance, like 61% in their models. Wow. So crossing EWI zero means the network is basically primed, structurally ready to collapse internally, just waiting for a nudge. Exactly. Waiting for that strong signal, which the CRI measures. Okay, so how does a network even get into that fragile EWI zero state? What are the uh, the factors driving this risk? The sources mentioned three knobs someone could turn. Yes, three main structural factors yeah. that influence the EWI. Things network designers, or maybe even attackers, could potentially manipulate. The first one is topology, how the network is actually wired together. This is measured by something called the network's influence score. Technically, the spectral radius of the adjacency matrix. Okay, influence score, meaning? It basically captures how centralized the connections are. If you shift from having lots of diverse relays and builders to, say, one big relay handling 60% of the traffic. Like a hub-and-spoke model. Precisely. That hub-and-spoke structure dramatically increases this influence score. And the research shows this is the single biggest risk factor. Structural centralization explains about 34% of the variance in cascade risk. 34%. Wow. And just to be clear, this is centralization of connections of information flow, not centralization of stake. Absolutely. Crucial distinction. It's about the market structure. Okay. That's knob number one, topology centralization. What's number two? Number two is technical herding. Call this the amplification factor. It's about relying too heavily on the same underlying technology. Like client monoculture. Exactly like client monoculture. If, say, 70% of all validators are running the exact same client software, then a bug in that software, or even just a planned update, forces them all to act in a correlated way. Even if they're run by totally different independent people. Right. It artificially forces their decisions together, amplifying any herding tendency. This tightens that stability margin we talked about, pushing EWI closer to zero. Okay, so topology centralizes influence, technical herding amplifies shared behavior. Mm. What pushes back against this? What's the buffer? That's a third knob. Damping forces. These are the elements creating friction in the system, slowing things down, allowing for correction. Like what? Things like validator churn. Validators joining and leaving the active set. Also exits and maybe even slashing events. These things disrupt perfect coordination. And increasing this friction, this damping, helps. It helps a lot. The research shows a strong, almost linear relationship. More damping significantly reduces the EWI, pushing it away from the danger zone. It basically slows down that rush to conform. Okay, these three knobs make sense individually. But the real danger is when they combine, isn't it? The stress tests and the research. Yeah, they modeled specific scenarios. Mm -hmm. Scenario S2 looked at relay concentration. They simulated shifting market share, so one relay had 60% up from a baseline of maybe 25%. And that alone pushed the EWI up significantly. It did. It increased that network influence score mm -hmm. by almost 30%, pushing the EWI much closer to zero, made the system far more fragile. Then they looked at client monoculture. Right, scenario S3. They modeled shifting to 70% dominance for one client. 
This cranked up the technical hurting factor, which again reduced the stability margin. But the truly sobering part was combining these factors, right? Absolutely. Yeah. The models show that if you get significant concentration, high technical hurt and high, high highs fly, and then you add a strong public signal, like a high CRI situation. The whole thing goes boom. Pretty much. The simulated cascade probability went from almost nothing, like 0.4% in the baseline, to a near certainty. Around 78% chance of failure in their combined shock model. Okay, this really brings us to the core implication, the provocative part, especially for things like stablecoins, which rely heavily on censorship resistance. Exactly. If that EWI turns positive, the network is fundamentally unstable from a strategic perspective. It becomes highly susceptible to coordinated action. Making system-wide transaction censorship, say targeting specific stablecoins or even forming cartels, much easier to pull off. Much easier. And this is where the Cascade Risk Index, CRI, becomes so important. Remember, the CRI measures vulnerability to public signals. The research suggests it flags whether an adversary could potentially trigger a cascade just by manipulating the information environment around a key player. Weaponize information driving strategic conformity. That's the idea. If CRI is greater than one, the network is basically vulnerable to information warfare. A strategically timed announcement, maybe even a fake one about new regulations or a relays policy change, could be enough to trigger the domino effect. And this isn't just an Ethereum problem, is it? The framework seems general. The sources mention other chains. It's universal for systems with the MEV auctions, yeah. Yeah. And they gave a fascinating illustrative estimate for Solana's Gito MEV auction market. What did they find there? Well, at the time of the research, Solana's Gito market was dominated by a single auction provider holding something like over 90% market share. 90%. That's almost total centralization in that layer. It's that extreme hub-and-spoke topology we talked about. Nearly every builder and proposer goes through this one entity. So their influence score must be sky high. Extremely high based on the topology. And because of that, the estimated cascade risk index, CRI, for Solana's MEV market was dramatically higher than Ethereum's. How high? Around 2.52. Compared to Ethereum's estimated baseline CRI of maybe 0.16 to 0.22. 2.52. That's way above the critical threshold of one. Way above. The implication, based on this framework, is that Solana's MEV auction structure might already be operating deep within a high cascade risk regime. Meaning it could be significantly more vulnerable to censorship or policy shocks triggered by public signals compared to Ethereum's current structure. That's what the structural analysis suggests, yes. Yeah. A stark difference driven purely by the market topology. So wrapping my head around this, the real attack vector isn't necessarily about cracking code or buying up stake anymore. It's about exploiting the structure, the game theory, the human tendency to conform within the economic layer of the blockchain. It's a more subtle but potentially very potent form of manipulation. Is there any good news? Does the framework offer ways to defend against this? Thankfully, yes. It doesn't just diagnose the problem, it points towards solutions. It even provides uh, specific mathematical thresholds for intervention. Oh, what's the key? The key is realizing you don't have to fix everything. You need to find the critical connections, the specific links that contribute most to this tipping point vulnerability. Finding the weakest links, basically. Sort of the strongest links in terms of influence, the ones carrying the most weight in potentially causing a cascade. The researchers developed an algorithm for this. An algorithm? What does it do? They call it the edge targeting algorithm. It uses some deeper math involving eigenvectors of the network matrix. Yeah. Let's just call it the influence map or power map. This map identifies the specific connections, the edges between individual builders, relays, and proposers that have the highest contribution to the overall instability or influence score. Ah, uh, okay. So it pinpoints the exact pathways where this dangerous conformity pressure is flowing most strongly. Exactly. And the insight here is powerful for defense. How so? Instead of trying to force diversification everywhere, which could be really hard, you can be surgical. You only need to target interventions at the top few most influential edges identified by this algorithm. Interventions like what? Rate limiting them, discouraging their use. Things like that. Maybe incentivizing alternatives or putting specific limits on those critical links. The point is, by neutralizing just those few key connections, you can significantly improve the overall stability margin and reduce the EWI. It's like finding the precise wire in a bomb that diffuses it instead of trying to rebuild the whole device under pressure. That's a great analogy. It allows for much more 
targeted and potentially effective interventions. So what practical policies come out of this framework? Well, the sources suggest clear actions based on those three knobs we discussed. Short term, the priorities are clear. Which are? Relay diversity mandates actively working to reduce the market share of dominant relays to lower that enderl till score. Mm -hmm. And client diversity campaigns encouraging validators to use a wider variety of client software to reduce technical hurting. Makes sense. Attack the biggest risk factors first. What about medium term? Medium term, the focus should be on damping enhancement finding ways to increase that healthy friction, maybe optimizing validator churn rates, execute mechanisms, things that inherently slow down cascades. Okay, so diversity now, friction later. That seems to be the strategic guidance from the analysis. This really feels like a fundamental shift in how we need to think about blockchain security. I agree. The risk landscape is evolving. We absolutely have to move beyond just looking at cryptography and staking numbers. Yeah. Monitoring and actively managing this network structural vulnerability is becoming just as important, maybe even more so in some contexts. So the key takeaway for you, the listener, seems to be understanding the influence score, the spectral radius of your network's MEV supply chain is now arguably as critical as tracking that 51% stake threshold ever was. That's a new dimension of security analysis we can't ignore. Okay, let's leave you with a final thought to chew on. If this research is right, an adversary might not need to hack anything or buy massive stake. If they can just successfully manipulate the information around a single central relay, maybe with a convincing fake announcement about a new censorship policy, and if that network CRI is already above one, they could potentially trigger a system-wide strategic cascade, achieving censorship or control indirectly. Mm -hmm. The question then becomes... Right. How decentralized does our communication infrastructure, the information layer around the blockchain, need to be to ensure true network stability against these kinds of information attacks? The next frontier might not be just code, but managing the echo chamber. Something to think about. That's all for this deep dive. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this content, please consider subscribing and liking. Your support helps us continue to provide more free resources on advanced science and research. Until next time.